Hi, I'm Anthony Martinez, Colonel with the Brown Beret National Organization. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming to our first annual Reflections of Chicano History, focused on the Pilsen and South Chicago neighborhoods, going back from the late 1960s and 1970s. Check out our videos on YouTube, please. Appreciate it. Que viva la causa. Ano. Chicano. In the 20s and 30s, we saw a rich history of migration to the South Chicago community. A lot of people were coming working on the stair, uh, I'm sorry, the railroads are coming to work in the U.S. steel industry. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of these things. But first, let me uh, introduce the panelists. So, first we have Edgar Najera. Um, Edgar was uh, born in Mexico City. He migrated to the U.S. in what we now call the Dreamers, but he, he ended up becoming... Uh, the original dreamer, right? He studied in um, UIC, earned a degree in urban education. He taught in Gary, Indiana. Edgar has also taught at Phil Sheridan within the southeast side of Chicago. Edgar has had a diverse uh, set of employment, including serving as a veteran in the U.S. Army. So uh, please, if you will, please give him a round of applause. And seated right next to him, we have Frank Corona, who many of us on the Switching. southeast side know. Um, Frank was uh, born in uh, 1951 on the southeast side of Chicago. Frank was involved in activism since the age of 17 when he joined the 1968 boycott and strike organized by Cesar Chavez um, and Dolores Huerta. Frank is a well-known leader in South Chicago, who many of us know he used to run a, a lot of youth activities including serving as a boxing coach and mentor for many youth in the area, and uh, he has been involved in area organizing and politics for decades. Please give Frank a round of applause, please. And last, but certainly not least, um, we are honored to have in Roman Villarreal, Villarreal with us, who grew up the second of six children uh, across from the steel mills in South Chicago area, an area that many of us know as the Bush, um, Roman uh, has traveled between Tampico, Mexico, uh, and Corpus Christi, Texas, and Benvenidas. Um, in his early years, in the 1960s, Roman had joined the uh, South Chicago branch of the Royal Knights uh, before seeking a different path at, through the U.S. military. So working in the area of steel mills, Roman pursued his love of art, opening up local art studios, including Under the Bridge Studios, in which we are here today. Um, Roman has used his art to tell the story of South Chicago, and many of us in the area are very proud of you, especially hearing about your story and your experiences, and we appreciate also having you join the panel. So, as we go on, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass you guys a microphone, and you guys can feel so free. Um, but uh, what we're going to do is we're going to ask the group a couple questions, and I've just got to pull out my questions here. But to kind of, uh, kind of start off, what I'm going to ask is I'm going to ask, you know, so I gave you guys an introduction, but... And I, I, I really doubt I did you justice, right? And I'm sure that there's a lot of experiences and things that you could talk about, but could you briefly just tell us, like, what do you feel your role was within the movements that have been happening within our communities? And I'll start off with Roman, and then we could kind of just pass the mic along. Well, the, the best way for anything is to be an example. By being an example, you set the way that it's supposed to be done. And it's real simple, something very simple that you could do in life. Anything you want to do, you have to do it yourself and be an example and a hamper. Because without that, it's, it's very difficult to continue the message that has to be told. So we as individuals have to be that example. And by example, you practice, you, you practice only on one particular thing. My main objective in La Vida was always to the arts. We had to figure out, okay, how am I going to contribute? My, because there are so many issues going on at the time. So I thought to myself, you can only do one. Concentrate on one, and mine was the contribution, contributing into the arts. And through the arts, we've been able to share our experience in the southeast side of the world. El que no lucha no gana. First of all, I want to say um, I just got back from Mexico, and uh, I want to dedicate this day today for the women 
El movimiento en México is moving fast and powerful, and our women are doing it. We elected, we elected the first, we elected the first Supreme Court female in Mexico. Our next president in the Republic of Mexico is going to be a Mexicana, a woman. And they're working hard over there, and I just like to thank the women that are here. The feminist movement is so powerful that we've had our chance, and. Uh, we blew it. The men have always been in charge, and even in the house in the background, it's always been the woman, my Juana, my mom, my grandmother. But um, dime con quién andas y te digo quién eres. That's right. And look it to my left and look it to my right. We're chingones. Wow. But, but it's not that we're from Bush, one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. It's surrounded by the, uh, the steel mills. It's that we struggled. And there's a podcast right now that uh, you mentioned, the Southeast, a city within a city. And there's this young man, Steve Walsh. You have to catch this podcast, please. This tells you what we've suffered here on the Southeast side from Bush to Hegwash when the steel mills closed. We have endured. We have survived. We are the survivors of something that wasn't planned here. When the steel mills closed, we faced another challenge. Again, a city within a city by Steve Walsh. Please, you, you have to see it. They just We just had the second showing at the University of Chicago. And um, I'd like to remind you, in, in Cinco de Mayo of 1971, 71, the Brown Berets, Marcha de la Reconquista begins. They were, we've always, with Chuy Negrete, I was so fortunate to travel with my brother. I'm still traveling with him. I dream about him. Mexico. He says, say it, Pancho. Los corridos de mi tierra siempre dicen la verdad. Siempre dicen la verdad los corridos de mi tierra. Y pregúnteme de guerra, yo que anduve por la sierra. El otro día hablaba con Petra, que me decía, subió el frijol. El otro día hablaba con Petra que me, que me dijo, subió el frijol, mis chavos vienen drogados, no hay trabajo ni compasión. El otro día hablaba con Petra que me decía, subió el frijol. Thank you. I didn't figure that this is going to be the set of the... These two are my compadres right here, okay? And Carlos over there, raise your hand. That's yeah. my compadre, okay? So I got three compadres right here, okay? Garitos. And that's how close we are. Yes, I come from Mexico City. And I came here when I was 14 years old, okay? And uh, being here in, in the schools, uh, I was a little uh, uh, uncomfortable with different situations in the classroom, so I had to move from one school to another. So I went to three primary schools and six different high schools, okay? And I ended up at Bowen and then to Highland High School, okay? Uh, I graduated three years, okay? I went to, to try to get into Chicago State, but I couldn't because I didn't have no papeles, okay? So, I tried to go and work at the mill, and at the mill, uh, I pass everything, I'm ready to go. And it's okay, tomorrow you bring your green card, and you're ready to work. Well, I didn't have a green card, so I went downtown, worked as a bar boy, became a bartender. So I traveled to different parts of the United States being a bartender, it's a real good job. But it wasn't getting me anywhere with borrachos, you know. I work at the in the distant world, I work in, uh, at the Marriott in Cleveland. Okay, I work downtown at the farmhouse. Okay. So I get to know my brother, Jesus Negrete. Jesus Negrete is, uh, I met Jesus Negrete in the streets. Okay. Chuy was my brother in this band. Okay, he, uh, was playing on the streets, you know, went to his house, I met his father, Bernardo, you know, we're real good friends, okay? And now I'm going downtown to take a class in Spanish literature, okay? 
and I was like, went in there and waited for these guys to come out of the classroom, found out that that was a very involved group called OLAS, Organization of American Students, okay? Uh, at that time, there was an election, and uh, you know, I voted for them, and at the end of the whole thing, I went back to South Chicago, and I said, Jesus, check this out, you know, there's a group out there, you know, called OLAS. So Jesus uh, said, okay. So for about three or four times, he told me he was gonna go. So he finally went, okay? And that's when we started going, doing things that were of importance to Chicano movement, okay? Went to Denver, okay? And we met Corky Gonzalez, okay? And other leaders there, okay? We went to East LA also, okay? And so the riot, the police riot, in August 29, 1970, okay? And that was the moratorium against the war in Vietnam, okay? I was there. Oh, they killed when they killed Ruben Salazar, okay? Just uh, funny that I ended up teaching at the school in Ruben Salazar, okay? And when I went to Ruben Salazar, I told the principal, you know, I saw how they killed Ruben Salazar, you know? So she kind of, you know, left it around, and said, okay, fine. So on his birthday, the principal told me, Edgar, I want you to be Ruben Salazar. So I immediately got uh, goosebumps. Okay. So I went to the first class was in kindergarten. And there in kindergarten, I start sobbing like I'm doing right now. And uh, the teachers told me, are you okay? He said, yes, and I'll be okay. So I start giving the presentation, you know, what happened to Ray Salazar. Kindergarten, you know, level, okay? So I did the whole uh, set of classrooms, okay? So now, uh, you know, you ask me, you know, what have I done in the movimiento? This is what I did with the Brown Berets, okay? I worked with the Brown Berets, and I didn't work in a clinic, collecting anything, you know, for the community. I was there at the riot, okay? And I saw how the police was beating up on the children and the women, okay? So now, how many men here would see this, would not jump and do something with that? So I saw the Brown Berets, they made a fence, you know, they put out the baton like this, and they held it while the people got to run because there was maze, and they kept dropping policemen from helicopters with big shields and big bats and going at, you know, beating up on the, on, beating up on the young ladies, the hijitas, okay? So I was, you know, working with just in sandals, you know, they came off and orally, you know, we went to it, okay? That's how I worked with the Ram Reds, okay? That was it, okay? I admired them you know, for what they did there, okay? Uh, I have a lot of things to say about the movimiento, okay? And this a time limit, I think, and I don't want to get too uh, involved, okay? Pero I'm going to tell you, you know, somos un pueblo sin fronteras. You know, son of what we born in Mexico, okay? But we Chicanos. You got Edward J. Somos. You have uh, Rubén Salazar, Alurista, Abelardo. These are Mexicans that were born in Mexico, and they work in the Chicano movement, okay? So, again, and we keep working. And I'd like to suggest at this moment to give room, to give pride for the, raise your hand, any of you that know that, the Los Doce de Sur Chicago, the South Chicago 12, raise your hand. Who, do, who knows about those guys? Okay? So let me tell you, and maybe my friend here, Frank, the compadre, to say who this 12 were, because he is, you know, he's been there, 
Okay. <clears throat> yeah, the, the 12 are the uh, 12 Mexicanos within a two mile radius that died in a monument in the Lady Guadalupe Church that were uh, killed in Vietnam. Uh, we have the highest, Mexicanos have the highest, the most Congressional Medals of Honor. We have uh, the leadership. We have the people with the potential to lead us. But I'd like to go back and, and, and say something about bilingual education because that's very important. Have we seen bilingual education in our grammar schools and high school? No. Labor history is very important in Chicago. We just had Labor Day, the Workers' Day. That was started in Chicago. The massacre on 117th, we're going to celebrate it on the 20th of May. You're invited on 117th and Avenue Hall where they killed 10 civilians, the police did. And in Milwaukee, they killed, I think, 17 civilians. Labor history is very important besides our bilingual history. We need bilingual education in Chicago. I have some stats here, and then I'll give you the mic, Robert. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Okay. Okay. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. yeah, yeah. Here. Okay, with that, I'd like to suggest for us to do something for those doce. Okay, for those 12 that died in Vietnam. And maybe look at, you have Alif Harvey, okay? Two guys that died in Vietnam, and something's named after them. Something should be named, okay, for these 12. Yeah, this is the corner, but this is a library, not too far, two blocks from there. Okay, that could be named uh, after them, okay? We're, we're gonna, and I, and I appreciate you guys, I feel like you guys are kind of jumping ahead of the yeah. questions, because we're, we're definitely gonna ask you about some of your suggestions going forward. Um, but you know, one of the, one of the things that I, I think was important for people to understand, especially when we're looking at the history of an area, is to try to understand the context behind it, right? So if you could just briefly, um, you know, from just kind of inform us a little from your earliest involvement, could you tell us a little bit about like what the scene was specifically in South Chicago during the time? And then whoever wants to, you guys can share with when I first came to South Chicago, it was 1968. Okay. Yes, when I first came to South Chicago, it was 1968. Okay. And I came from uh, the school in the north side, uh, Lane Tech. Okay. So I came here with my sweater, you know, patches and all that. And, of course, there was a group of students there that were cheating in the classroom, and the teacher let them. She knew that they had a book open, you know, in a closed middle book. Uh, test, okay, bilingual education, okay, I was a bilingual teacher, okay, right now, in our schools, there's nothing, there's no teachers, Hispanic, black, or white, they talk about our history, okay, we should, you know, promote our history, okay, because we have history right here, okay, 1920, I just heard, okay, and I know from before, you know, that we should, you know, go in the classrooms, change that curriculum, and he had our history talk, okay? This, you know, this uh, man right here, uh, Mr. Chico, okay, his family, 1920, 1920 over here. Do they have a history? There's books already written about, you know, this area, okay? They should be used in a high school. Give us pride, give us pride by learning our language, by learning our history. Okay, so so kind of kind of going back, and I, I just kind of want to keep us in, in kind of on track. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, but uh, going back to what what the scene was like, right? You, Edgar, you described some of it. Do you, you, can you add a little bit to like what what was what was the area like? What were things going on? And yeah. okay, uh, remember now why this is the first not back of the eyes, not Pilsen, not Twenty Sixth Street. Why this was the first Mexican community. The steel mills, they were booming, money. You leave one steel mill, go to the next one. Factories or railroads, I worked for the railroad also. My family were steel workers. I belonged to SOAR, the steel workers retiree uh, organization. Commercial was booming. Even our little community of Push was booming. Storefronts, Mount Paz stores, and taverns, hijo de la fregada. Cantinas por donde quiera. Cantinas, three or four on the block. But it was good. The economy, there was kids outside playing at two in the morning. We'd walk to walk home. You'd come home and, and you'd see people in the park. You know, it wasn't like there is right now, fear. There's fear right now. You shouldn't have fear. But 
it was it was a good time. Uh, Dolores Huerta, I remember her, and, 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 and I don't care who Kerry calls Caesar, but we were at the local uh, local 65 in South Chicago Union Hall, where we had all our dances and our fundraisers. I was I was boxing. I was I was putting on exhibitions there when I was boxing back then. But Dolores Huerta, the meet people that gives you animo, when you run into some people that give you they give you that momentum, that, that inspiration is what we had. Plus the community, the police weren't like they are now. There were there was something there's something wrong, there's something broke. But it was great. Commercial, you had Goblets, Lester's Regions. I'm not talking about uh, you know Chinese one dollar stores. It wasn't the, no dollar stores. Uh, but it was it was nice. It was great. The families we knew our neighbors. Everybody went down commercial. We knew the store owners. We knew our neighbors. We talked to them. And we'd be out late at night, 2 in the morning, 3, coming back. Walking. People be outside on the front porch waving, saying hello. Something changed in the 80s. Mine would be very simple. When the mills closed, the world changed for South Chicago. Yep. Yep. Yes. Uh, definitely. So, in a moment, I think you're kind of touching and, and kind of leading us to our next question, which is really about, you know, during during that time, um, can you kind of briefly discuss, like, what were some of the major issues, right? I know Frank and uh, Edgar kind of touched on, but I kind of want to start with you and then we'll kind of go back. But could you tell us, like, what were some of the issues people were going through and facing? Well, again, when that mill closed, every issue that was out there, we don't even have to name them. We all know that it was everything. Like everything that could go wrong went wrong in this community. We were almost middle class. We almost had an opportunity to start buying homes, cars, and the brothers and family members that did buy these things, they had to give them back when the mill closed. We don't realize the, 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 the impact on the families after the mill closed. Everybody had to learn to survive. A lot of mistakes were made by men and women who were trying to survive, but yet we're here, we're surviving. And all I can say is, with the, lead, the new leaders of our community, like Mr. Chico and uh, Anna Guardado, who also ran for the thing, they have the community in their heart, hopefully that we all work together, which is the only way we could do it. This community will survive and go to the next level for our children. Piggyback on that. Um, we were left out. Usually, the neighborhood when, when things close down, like the mills, you have federal government, federal federal programs coming, money's comes in, money coming in, and you have something. There was nothing here, so we have been through something sil similar to a depression of twenty nine. I don't want to say compare it, but it was bad here. So let me let me tell you that Calumet Park. This is the 10th ward, is the largest ward in the city, in all the wards. I, I was born and raised in the bush, and I lived in the 7th ward, did a lot of my community work in the South Chicago Neighborhood House. We had the MCC, the Mexican Community Committee. We had uh, the Mexican Patriotic Club on commercial. We had uh, Pilsen, Casa Tzlan. But when they started to close, I felt something. I said, I used my favorite word. My wife, Yolanda, says, stop, don't be negative, but it's the truth. It's, by, it's not us. It's not us. It's by design. When somebody wants something, they'll take it. Mm -hmm. My son Johnny is writing, working on his PhD. And I said, Miko, you know, some, I don't understand some of these words, Miko, you know, manifest destiny and eminent domain. You know, these are words that we've heard before. And guess what? If we don't have our children learning about our the politicians, the educators, and the politicians, how they identify. The politicians, they're not a lot about education, a lot of them. It's funding first for them, money, you know. So, Chicano education is, needs to be funded. If, if the city colleges, and I'm not even mentioning UIC, Northwestern, or any of the Chicago located universities, uh, my focus would be with the city colleges. Uh, because, yes, we are predominated a lot by the uh, African-American history. 
But I think intersectionality would help us understand why it's a me our mental state, how we, how do we find ourselves the meta, the metacognitive. You know how you start your car, you put the key in the engine and start the engine, the ignition, we got a cognition. So that's, when you go out in public, you, when you get older, you recognize you're going out in public. So uh, Chicano studies, again, it's always money is important, but for the rich, it's like, ah, it's a write-off. It's nothing for the corporate mentality. But for the grassroots, we need a dollar. Who doesn't have a dollar to play the, to play the game for the La Causa? So, um, yes, after the money, then we look at us where we at geographically. The rivers, the Chicago River, the Calumet River, big industry. It will be in trouble by, not in trouble, but the, you know, the, polit the politics, that's when it becomes political. There's a lot, you know, do we want them to learn about, Chica do we want them to learn about certain things and that go against, and that's called, that's called counter story, that's called oral history. Because a lot of us don't have, the reality, our literacy rates are, are low. Because a lot of us prefer, not prefer, but we were made, our minds don't think about reading and sitting down for a half an hour to get ready to read. We gotta get ready and go outside and take the bus or get in our cars to go to work. So it's a working class ideology in the city of Chicago. Um, but yes, a Chicano studies here in the Midwest, in Chicago, is what is heavily needed, but it would make us very empowered. And we would have to learn about intersectionality, and we would have to learn about um, how to separate education from politics, how to separate government from higher education. And we can do it. Yeah. Thank you. And, and then I think, uh, Alice? Well, there, there is a current effort, a current effort uh, at the University of Illinois. Uh, within the Latin American and Latino Studies program. There are a number of members and students also who want to set up a Chicano Studies program within Latin American and Latino Studies, which is something that we, we should do, should go ahead and, and do. Um, we, uh, we also have to, when we talk about uh, Latinos in general, and to stand in solidarity with Latinos. It's fine and dandy. Uh, there's, only, there's only one pitfall, that if we use the word Latino or Hispanic, uh, the other Latinos are also gonna come in, and that's fine. The only problem is that we as Mexicans are the majority, the vast majority of Latinos in the country. Uh, 67 million Latinos in the United States, I think 48 million are Mexican, okay? So uh, by far, we are the majority. Now, that majority in numbers does not reflect uh, in the numbers of positions uh, in colleges and universities, and doesn't reflect even in, even in Latin American studies. This is the first time, the first time since Latin American studies was, was expanded in in 1970, this is the first time that we have a Mexican in charge of Latin American and Latino studies. The first time. Okay? In the past, they've been Cuban, Puerto Rican, Ecuadorian, South American, etc. That's fine with me, but hey, year after year, time after time, no Mexican, no Chicano is in charge of the program. It says something, right? We're, we're very acquiescent. Okay, we we uh, we allow others to come in, and that's fine. Come in and be a part of us, but don't come in and dominate us. Okay, don't come in and rule us and control us like a nutcase. Uh, yes, the uh, the 1968 walkout in Los Angeles made national headlines. It was uh, the article. It was written by. Uh, Salgado, no, 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 it was written by Bernal, Delgado Bernal. And they mentioned, very interesting, 
after the 1968 walkout in 1993, the Chicano Studies Department of UCLA, there was none. So 15 years later at the high school level, at the college level, uh, it was UCLA in 1993, they, w they went to jail. They were arrested and went to jail because they protested the, the they, were, they didn't have a Chicano Studies program. Now it's the Cesar Chavez uh, Chicano Studies Department. Um, mm -hmm. But in 1993, after the secondary level, it went to the higher level, and it's just gonna keep going up. It goes up to the government, to lawyers, and it just starts at the bottom, starts at the baby, and then all the way to the top. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. So we, we appreciate your responses. And just uh, before we get to our final question from the audience, just one more, one more real quick uh, announcement. Speaking on the idea of how do we continue, right? Um, this is Giovanni, and um, you know he is a representative of the Dombre National Organization here. Um, he has a sign-in sheet right in the front, and what we're going to ask is in terms of continuing, right, what we have going on here, and I hope you all agree with this, we would like for each of you to leave your name, leave a number, possibly leave an email, because one of the things we would like to do is we would like to continue these conversations. You know, we said first annual, right? We hope to see you all again next year where we continue these conversations, we continue this process, share you know, the information. I saw a lot of you out there recording for your social media, share that. We want people to see what our history is about, what our culture is about, what our struggles for resistance are about. You see right here we have all these wonderful local artists who have been sharing with you their voices, their artwork, right? You have, hear, you have heard from them the stories within their art, within their music, right? Support our local artists that are speaking to our revolutionary causes. Continue to support them and help them to speak. You know, art, art isn't just about, you know, having a good time and, you know, celebrating, right? It's also about raising awareness, teaching, and continue to build upon the movement. So that being said, do we have one final question for the, from the audience? Can, can you please come up? Thank you so much. Hi, um, my name is Jessica. Um, I'm a fourth gen resident or a fourth generation resident of the southeast side of Chicago, Slag, East Side, I wish almost all of them, Bush, South Deering. I have family in every single one of them that have grown up in the 10th Ward. Um, I guess my question for any of the panelists that were from the southeast side, the 10th Ward, um, um, I guess. Tomorrow or next year, what do you hope to see from the youth? What what do you envision for the southeast side? I know you guys were talking about how it used to look and how it used to be. You know, commercial was popping. There was businesses. There was bars. You used to be able to be safe and to go outside. What if you could have what you wanted right now and see what you wanted in your community right now? What would that be? People renting the rooms. Uh, the rest of it is just kind of abandoned. Okay, so that's one. The other thing is, again, you know, let's get involved, you know, with our youth in the schools, okay? You know, how many kids do you see in the streets now that are gang members, okay? I just uh, had a friend that wanted to commit suicide, okay? So they took him into the crazy house, and, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. But, and he was very active, he was very active worker, and, you know, why? Because his children were just doing the wrong things. Carlos, no te vayas. Una pregunta, Carlos. Este, our neighborhood is, has always followed, and we've always been involved with 18th Street. Because, uh, myself and, and the artist Roman, because of Tuna and uh, the, because of the politics, we followed. It was always 18th Street ahead, uh, Pilsen, uh, uh, La 26 Second. And South Chicago more or less followed your lead because we did, we weren't that together. We didn't have the organizations like Kazatzlan. But I did get to go to Kazatzlan. My question, you, you know, we need to get together and talk. You brought up something very important. I've been involved all my life as a community activist. I'm not a community organizer. I'm a community activist. There's a difference. Um, we need, we, we've always talked about doing this, a task force. We need a task force. A task force means big the heads, the smart ones, not myself. I'm a, I'm a foot soldier. Wait, wait. We need the heads who have the answers already, the attorney. 
And my Esther brought something very important. How we won the elections with Barack Obama and Carol Washington, we had a coalition. They're anti-coalition in Chicago. Uh, we're being, in my opinion, we're being used. You know, the politics here is, I, I forget what analogy I may comparing it to. But your, 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 your experience and what, the knowledge you have from the past and to the present, because there's, you know, I thought there was going to be a coalition. And you know what they did to Chuy? Garcia, that's who I, I've always worked with, uh, Chuy Garcia, my congressman, our only congressman. We should have, our congressional district, we should have three or four Latin Mexi Mexicanos. Yep. Like you said, I'm yep. sorry. Mexicanos. Yep. Now, the other thing we should have is senators. No, but you young people, you young people should be saying, hey man, we got so many, why is it one senator? And um, one, this, these are, he's waiting. He's waiting for somebody, young women, and these young Man, people got to pick his brain. Team Ford, a task force, and say these are the solutions. You're asking the questions, the answers are here. here. Uh, the, the thing is, a task force, have, is that possible? What, I, what I'd like to suggest is maybe if we, if we could follow this activity with uh, maybe a couple of weeks, a month at the most, convene another meeting. Those of you who are interested, who want to come come again, come back again, and meet, and then plan, not just for next year. Because uh, on 26th Street and 18th Street, we've been talking about having our own activities also uh, this in the fall. We've had uh, meetings about the Chicano movement like two years ago, before the pandemic. Two or three meetings at the Osama Library where we're talking about the legacy of Corky Gonzalez and others. So we intend to continue that, but we want to go just, we want to go beyond honoring their memory and their legacy. We want to put their words and their ideas into practice along with ours. So what I'm calling for is, why don't you convene the second next meeting, maybe in a, in a month, we'll, we'll come your way, we'll meet here, and then take it from there. Thank you. Good idea. Thank you. Before you go, just really quickly, um, Anthony Martinez, uh, he's going to present some, uh, you know, on behalf of the Brown Race, he's going to present some awards, but let me go ahead and uh, hand over the mic to him. Uh, yes, Carlos, uh, hold on, please, can you come over? Carlos, please. Uh, on behalf of our organization, the Brown Beret National Organization, Chicago chapter, we organized this event and we made uh, some uh, certificates, plaques of recognition for the member, for who's been involved here. First off, we'd like to a uh, certificate of recognition signed by uh, me and my captain right here, Giovanni Baltazar. This is for we appreciate you, Juan Manuel Solis. Thank you for your years of sacrifice, service, and struggle. We need you for our casa. Without you, it wouldn't be easy for our gente. Much love and respect from the Brown Bray National Organization, Chicago chapter. Wow. This one is for Frank Corona. Thank you, Frank. Edgar Najir. I go by. Santa Julio Reggie Gonzalez. Romeo Vergariel. Carlos Herrera. Yeah. yeah. Let's do it, Carlitos. Way. Juanita. <laughs> <laughs> my, my son is leaving. So okay. I gotta go. Okay. I'm leave by the right. moment. Julia Morales. Let's see. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. And, and we'd also like to thank Rosalba. Yes. And, uh, and John. And another Negrete sister who, who came in. Ah, no. Chicano 
chicano, yo soy chicano, and I'm proud, and I know I can do it in my own good way. Some people say we're crazy, some people say we're lazy, no soy, soy puro mexicano, chicano, yo soy 